morning. Um, what an awesome morning to, to start uh, Sunday with, right? Four baptisms. We were supposed to have five, but uh, the, the young lady, uh, Lexi's friend, ended up having to work. And isn't that exactly the way Satan does it? She says she wants to be baptized, but guess what? They, they make her work. So you know what? But we'll get her baptized. Don't you worry about that. Um, and, and I just want to tell you, you guys this morning are on fire. Amen. Man, this is nice to see. Go ahead and give yourselves a round of applause. Good job. Let me open with a word of prayer since I didn't get to do that with the praises and prayer time. And by the way, Shelly's stepping up this morning. Amen? Yeah. yeah. I need to stay back there more often. No, she says. All right, let's pray together. God in heaven, we ask your Holy Spirit to fall this morning to preach through me in a mighty and powerful way that, God, I would just get out of the way. That, Father, your Spirit would anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And, Father God, that you'd give us the words we need to hear this morning. Open hearts and open minds to receive what you have, that we will have willing hearts today, Father. We love you and we praise you. Whatever happens here today, we give you the glory. And if anybody is unsaved, we pray that they'll accept Jesus today. And it's in Jesus' powerful, life-transforming name that we pray. And everybody said... Amen. All right, so we're going to talk this morning about a willing heart, okay? Um, and, and we're going to look at a few different things that have to do with a willing heart. And um, we're going to see what the results are if you have a willing heart. Uh, please stand with me if you're able this morning for the reading of God's holy word. And it comes out of Judges chapter 5, and we're going to be reading verses 1 to 3. And then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day, saying that the leaders led in Israel and that the people volunteered. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers. I to the Lord, I will sing. I will sing praises to the the Lord, the God of Israel. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. You may be seated. When we're talking about willing hearts, Dr. David Jeremiah, many of you know who he is, has this to say about, um, about our hearts. Our hearts are naturally stubborn and self-willed. Anybody in here fall into that category? Amen. But when we offer ourselves willingly to the full will of God, it blesses the Lord and blesses us too. Amen. We all, if we're going to be honest with ourselves and with the Lord, we are all stubborn people. We want what we want, when we want it, and how we want it, and for how long we want it. Right? We don't, we don't want to give in to this idea that someone else is going to tell me how I'm going to live my life. We don't want to give in to this idea that someone else is going to tell me what to do or what not to do. We want to live our lives the way we want. And so we are naturally stubborn and self-willed self people. And so we're going to look this morning at what happens when we get rid of the natural tendencies of many of us and have a willing heart. That's what we're going to look at. In our scripture this morning, uh, Judges 5, I need you to have a little context to understand this. And I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes uh, version. So uh, the book of Judges comes right after uh, the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, right? And after the Israelites had been captive for 400 years of Egyptian captivity, they were let go. And in and, and the second chapter of Joshua or in Judges, we see that Joshua died. Okay, so Joshua led the Israelites uh, after Moses and then Joshua dies. And so the, the Israelites are left without leaders. You know, like before they had one leader who, who you just looked at and knew this is the leader. This is who we answer to. This is who God is called. This is who God is telling us to follow. So they were without that. And so what happens is God says, you know what, I'm going to give you judges to be your leaders, to be your judges and to, to help lead you Israel. Because Israel. Israel were a pretty stubborn people, amen? Much like the church of today. We're pretty stubborn. We, wanna, we want what we want. And uh, you know what's cool is in the newspaper article yesterday that uh, they did on the association, they quoted me about saying 200 churches a week are dying. So now a lot of people are starting to see that. Not just you guys who hear it from me all the time. But it's because we're stubborn and self-willed. 
Okay, and so were the Israelites. And so they kept getting themselves in trouble. They would serve God, and then they would start sinning, and God would have to bring his wrath. And then they would come back, and they would serve God, and then they would start sinning, and God would have to bring his wrath. And this was just a cycle that just kept happening. Many of you could look at your lives over the past however many years since you've been saved and go, Wow, that's the pattern of my life. Man, I get close to God, I start serving Him, and then I just slowly start fading away and I start sinning and God brings something in my life. And then I come back to God and I start serving God, I get close to God, and then all of a sudden I start falling away and I start sinning. It's a cycle, isn't it? All of us fall into this trap. And I'm not justifying it, I'm not saying it's okay, I'm just saying that it happens. And so, in, in chapter 3 and 4 of Judges, what we saw was Israel got led into captivity again. In other words, another king and his people showed up to take Israel captive because they had been sinning. And so, Deborah was a prophetess, a judge in Israel. She was someone that God had placed in charge to judge Israel, to tell them the way they should go. And so Barak was a man uh, who was an Israelite, and he came to Deborah one day and was to take 10,000 men of God and take over this king who was about to attack them. See, he was a warrior. He was a fighter in Israel. And so he goes to Deborah and says, Deborah, what do I do? We're about to be attacked. And Deborah goes, God says, take 10,000 men and go fight. Go fight this king. So guess what he does? He valiantly says, I'm going to go. No. He says, Deborah, I'll only go if you go. Boy, that sounds like a real man's man, doesn't it? <laughs> Deborah, I'll only go if you go. Man, that, that sounds like some husband's. I'll only do it if my wife allows me, and, and I'll leave that alone. Let that one preach on its own. And so, so, here's what he does. He says, all right, Deborah, I'll go if you'll go, and I'll take 10,000 men. She goes, let's go. And so God routed this king in a way that it was going to come across Barak and his men, okay? And so um, the, Barak shows up, and him and his men fight, and, and they take the enemy, and they beat him, except one problem. This king, Sisera, gets away, Okay? And so King Sisera flees, and, and he goes to this lady. He, he knows she's, he's friends with her husband, and she goes, I'll help you out. She goes, I'll help you out. And so he says, can I have some food and drink? And she goes, yeah, sure. I'll give you some food and drink. So she gives him some food and drink. At this point, the enemy of Israel, the King Sisera, thinks, hey, I've got an ally here, right? She's taking me in. She's hiding me. She's giving me food and drink. And he goes, you know what? I'm wore out from all this fighting and all this running. I'm going to take me a nap. So he kind of wraps up in a little rug, falls asleep. Here's where it gets interesting. So this is where it gets Jerry Springer show type stuff. What happens is this lady that he thinks is his friend takes a peg of a tent. Tent peg. And a hammer. She walks up, kneels down as he's sleeping. And guess what she does? Right in his forehead. Kills him. Just walks up, doesn't think twice, bam. Phew. Kills him instantly. So then Barak and his men show up and they're like, have you seen King Sisera? And she goes, actually, yeah, he's right in there. He opens up her tent and he walks in and he's laying there dead. Now, isn't that something? The Bible, I'm telling you what, the Bible holds nothing back. You think your families are crazy? And I know some of your families, and I agree with some of you, but you think your families are crazy? You ought to read some of these stories in the Bible, dude. I'm telling you what, it's crazy, some of the stuff that happens in the Bible. This is just one of those stories. You know, she kills him. And so this is where we pick up in, in Judges 5 this morning. We pick up with Deborah and Barak singing a song. And so that leads us to a reason to sing this morning. 
If you are a born-again believer, and, and I pray every one of you is, and if you're not, Jesus died on the cross for you so you can be saved. You need to know that today. And if you're a born-again believer and you're going through the worst time in your life, things are just bad. It doesn't matter how bad they are. You always have at least one thing to sing praises about. And that very one thing that you have to sing about is the fact that you're a born-again believer. If you're saved, it doesn't matter how bad life is, you're going to heaven if you die today. You have a hope that so many people in this world don't have. You have a hope that when you die, you're going to heaven. So no matter how bad life is right now, you have a reason to sing. You have a reason to praise God. And this morning, I can't say a whole lot because this morning, man, you guys were awesome. You guys were praising God like you should be. Yes, you guys were lit this morning. <laughs> Stop. That, by the way, that's a word that means cool. I'm learning all this uh, young people uh, terminology, and they hate it when us old people do that. So it's fun. See, he's telling me to stop. You guys seriously were on fire this morning, and it was awesome. You guys had a reason to sing, amen? Amen. amen. And if you're a born-again believer, I want you to remember this. If you remember nothing else, when bad times come, when trials come, you have a reason to sing. And that is that the precious blood of Jesus Christ covers your soul. You are saved. Amen. And so in verse 2 this morning, we see that the people volunteered. Let me tell you something. When we have an event where we need people to volunteer and do things, and I show up and there's two or three people and we need 20, I'm really not showing up and singing praises to God that morning. As, as your leader, as, a, as the leader of this church, I'm not showing up going, man, God, this is great. We got one-tenth or whatever it is of what we need. But when we show up and there's 17, 18 people and we need 19 or 20, you know what? I'm showing up praising God. And this is what these two leaders, Brock and Deborah, were doing. The people volunteered. You see, it takes a willing heart. We can give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to do stuff for Jesus, but you've got to have a willing heart. You've got to be willing to serve. And I promise you, I won't sing out loud. Well, okay, I can't say that. I won't promise you. Most of the time, I won't sing out loud when, when we got volunteers. I'll try not to. But I'll be singing in my soul. I promise you that. Because when people volunteer, big things happen. You think about it. When the people, the body of Jesus rallies together... They get outside of themselves. They quit thinking about their lives and what they want to do. And they get together for a common purpose in the name of Jesus. The world takes notice. People sit up and go, wow. There's something about those people. Look at them. They have 30 people show up next week to, do, to clean up our streets. But you got to have a willing heart. You got to have a willing heart. You got to be ready and willing to help. And some of you go, but, you know, Pastor, I just got this and I got that. Yeah, we all got a lot of things in our lives, right? We can take an hour and pick up some trash, we can take an hour and do this, an hour and do that. And I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm not. I'm just trying to get you to see that when you willingly serve God, it makes Him happy. And it makes your leadership happy. The key to this is the Lord wants us to have a willing heart to volunteer. Wants us to. He doesn't want to make us. He doesn't want to gild us. He wants us to be so in love with Jesus 
that when opportunities to volunteer and serve other people arise, we can't wait to help people. I mean, I tell you what, when I get to help somebody, it is so fulfilling. It is so fulfilling when I get to help somebody. When you get to lead someone to salvation and you, and you are a part of that and you realize, man, I helped, I helped that person and I served that person and now they get saved, Amen. there is no greater feeling in this world. Amen. There's none. And so that gives us a reason to sing when, when people volunteer leaders. Man, we just want to sing praises. God, they showed up today. God, they heard your voice and they're willing. God, they're volunteering. And we have a kind of a joke around here. We call it voluntold. A lot of people get voluntold to do things, right? But, but in all honesty, if people really didn't want to do it, they would just not do it. We got to have that willing heart to want to do it, Right? And so we got to have a willing heart. And that gives us a reason to sing. The other thing they were singing about is that leaders led. Leaders lead. Now this seems like such a funny, um, funny thing to even have to mention to me. Okay? But in so many churches, pastors don't understand. And more importantly, the congregations don't understand that pastors are leaders. You know, in a lot of churches, churches want their pastors to just show up and, and take care of them and come to the hospital when they say to come to the hospital, to jump when they say jump. And they want them to do all of these things that we are called to do and that we do, but they forget that we're leaders. The Bible calls us leaders. And when leaders don't lead, God removes them. God gets them out of the way. Because leaders have to lead. And so Deborah and Barak were singing praises to God because leaders were leading. And this just seems so silly to me that we even have to say this, but we do. In verse 2, we see that. And, and then in 1 Corinthians 12, we see that there's a spiritual gift called leadership. Okay? But once you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside you and you get gifts. You get spiritual gifts to serve other people with. And some people have a supernatural ability to lead. They're the kind of people that, man, when they show up in a room of leaders, the other leaders look at them. The other leaders just naturally want to follow these people. They just show up and, and people realize, man, that's a leader. And they have that supernatural ability to lead. But every pastor has the gift of leadership. Some of them just don't realize it. And I believe, this is my personal belief, is that every single person is a leader. Take that in for a minute. Every single one of you is a leader. Now you go, wait a minute. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not a chairman of this or a chairwoman of that. How am I a leader, pastor? When you went to lunch this week and you said, hey guys, let's go here. And they went with you, you just practice leadership. When you're sitting in school and you tell the guys around you or the kids around you, hey guys, listen, the teacher needs us to listen right now. And they listen, that's leadership. When you tell your family member, you need to come to church and they come to church, that's leadership. Because really what leadership is, is influence. Did you know that? Did you know that it's core simplicity, leadership is influence? And all of you have influence over at least one person. You know who that is? Yourself. That's right. All of you have leadership over at least one person, and that's yourself. And I believe that leaders can grow. I believe that all of us can grow in our leadership ability. Every month, our, our senior leaders, the, the ones who are over boards and committees, I do leadership development with them, trying to teach them leadership skills. Because everybody's a leader, we just need to grow it. I still read books, I still take classes, I still do stuff on leadership. And so should you. Because if you want to change this world, we need to step up and be leaders. Amen? <clears throat> You see, they were happy 
Because leaders who led righteously with godly fervency with the Word of God as their moral compass. Can you imagine? How many times have we seen on TV pastors and other spiritual leaders who've gotten thrown out because they've done things they shouldn't have done? They lose all credibility, don't they? That's the same with you and with me. If we're doing things we shouldn't be doing, we're going to lose our leadership credibility with the people around us. If you're, if you're telling jokes or you're cussing at work or you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, you're going to lose your leadership ability with those folks around you. We need leaders who lead righteously, with godly fervency, with the Word of God as your moral compass. And you don't have to have a title to be a leader. You can be a leader right where you are. I believe there's two keys to success as a leader. People have to lead and people have to be willing to follow leaders. That means all of us who are over something need to be leaders. We need to step up and be leaders. And that means for the rest of us, we need to be willing and humble to follow leaders. Imagine if you show up at your job, if you've got a job, and your boss tells you you need to do something, and you're like, no, I ain't doing that. Wait, what's going to happen? Say yeah. Don't let the door hit you, right? You're going to get fired. We need to have that same attitude in church. We need to be willing to follow the vision that God has given us. We need to be willing to do our part and follow if we're going to be successful. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over you, your souls, as those who give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. I've been in the ministry for a few years now. And I've led a lot of people over the years, many different events, many, many churches, many organizations, many different things. And there's been some people who are real joys to lead. I mean, seriously, you're just like, I want a hundred of you. If I had a hundred of you, I could do, God could do amazing things through me. And then there's people that you're just like, really, dude, seriously, you're going to nitpick about that. You're going to gripe about that. You're going to complain about that. And they just want to make life miserable. Scripture says to follow our leaders. And it says we need to do this so they can have joy and not grief. Because it's going to be unprofitable for you if you do this. If you give your leaders grief, you know who's accountable for that? You. That's kind of scary, isn't it? That's kind of scary. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over your souls as those who give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. You know what it takes to do this? A willing heart. To submit. To obey. We don't like to do that. We like things our way, don't we? Even in the church. We want this and we want that and we don't want a wall painted. We don't want this, we don't want that. We don't want a scuff on the, you know, this, that, or the other. We don't want a scuff on the wall. These kids are running around crazy. We need to get them under control. You know how many times I've been told that? You know what my response is to that? Man, we got them in church. You know how many churches don't have kids in church? The vast majority. We got them here. Let God change them. Amen? Amen. In 1 Peter 5, 2, it says this. <clears throat> Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Pastors are called to lead churches. We are called to lead churches. I'm called to lead you guys. 
Exercising oversight, not under compulsion. That means I don't do it because I feel like I have to. I do it because I want to. I don't do it for money. I do it because I want to, because God has called me to lead. It's called a willing heart. Are you going to have a willing heart to lead where, where God's placed you? To make a difference? To get rid of the language, to get rid of the bad jokes, to get rid of the, the sour attitudes. Have a willing heart to lead people around you. That's what it takes. We've got to have a willing mind in serving God. Look at this. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. As for you, my son Solomon, know the, the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will, f you, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. This is King David speaking to his son, okay, Solomon. King David was at the end of his life. He's getting ready to, to move on, to die. And so this is where we're at with, with this. King, Saul, King David shows up to Solomon and says, listen, you need to have a willing mind. Because how many of us, how many of us show up begrudgingly, well, the pastor made me feel guilty. I'll show up to that stupid street sweep. Our minds aren't really wanting to be here, are they? And under our breath, boy, we're just kind of cursing that pastor. Yeah, I get cursed sometimes, guys. King David says, you got to have a willing mind. we got to get our minds in check to want to willingly serve God. It's not easy. It's not easy. You see, King David did this in front of all of his leaders. He had gathered together all of his leaders of Israel, and he said this to his son in front of everybody. And King David also tells his son to serve with his whole heart. And that means you hold nothing back for your love of the Lord. How many of us hold something here? Something that we love just a little bit more than the Lord. Something we're willing to put above God and serving Him. Just that little thing. Maybe others know about it, maybe others don't know about it. But King David says to love God with all your heart. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, what's the first and greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbors yourself. Love God with everything. Don't hold nothing back. He says to have a willing mind. And how many of us, man, with this willing mind thing? Okay, Jesus, if you'll show me, I'll believe. How many of us have done that at some point or another? Right? Come on, don't, don't be shy. But you know, so many times what Jesus tells us is he says, believe, then you'll see. Believe, then you'll see. There are times where God will show us things ahead of time, but most of the time Jesus says, you know what? Believe and then I'm going to show you something amazing. I'm going to show you a miracle if you'll believe. And so we got to get our minds into this mindset that we believe God at his word with everything. We willingly believe God. We don't question a million things. If the Bible says it, we believe it. That's tough, isn't it? Because we're raising people today that has to know the answer to everything. Right? You can ask my kids how many times they said, but why? And I said, because I said so. How many of you parents say that? Amen. How many of you grandparents said that? Yeah? How many of you kids heard your parents say that? Everybody raise your hands. We've all heard that at once, right? And so we've heard because I said so. But why is it when God says, thus saith the Lord, we have to question and doubt everything he says? Because we don't have a willing mind to believe God and trust. He says you got to have a willing mind to believe him at his word. When he says, because I say so, 
Okay, Dad in heaven, I believe. I'll do what you say. I'll follow. And our last point we want to look at this morning is we want to be willing to give. Okay? When we're willing to give, amazing things happen. Look at this. 1 Chronicles 29, 6-9. Then the rulers of the father's households and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds with the overseers of the, over the king's work offered willingly... And for the service for the house of God, they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold and 10,000 of silver and 18,000 talents of brass and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in care of Jael the Gershonite. And then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly. For they made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart, and King David also rejoiced greatly. You see, what this is talking about is the building of the temple. When they were getting ready to build the temple, the house of worship to God, the people were giving willingly. It says they gave with their whole heart. The New Testament puts it this way. Don't give begrudgingly. That means if, you know, and it's funny because I was just talking about this this morning with someone. You know, you see people on the side of the road and so many of us just have that natural thought of get a job. And when God says to give to them, many of us won't. Some of us will, but we do it begrudgingly. Like under our breath, I don't really want to give you this, but here you go. You need to get a job. How's that for some tips? What God wants us to do Oh, don't act like none of you have never done that. Seriously. Come on. What we need to be doing when God says to give to that person, in the name of Jesus, God bless you, here you go. That's what these folks, folks were doing when they were given to the house of God. They weren't holding it back like, oh, i got to put in my tithe this week. I don't really want to, but here you go, God. Like, you need it more than me. You say you own a cattle on a thousand hills. Like, you need my money, God. Some of you ever done that? Don't answer. God already knows. You see, they gave willingly. If they had precious stones, here you go. Can you imagine the offering plate being passed and people putting their diamond necklaces in? Wouldn't that be something? That'd be amazing. I don't, I don't even know what we'd do with that. What would we do with that? Take it to a pawn shop? <laughs> I'd go broke waiting on yours. <laughs> we need to give willingly, with a willing heart. God has called this church, look, I'm telling you what, God has called this church to some big things. Our best days aren't behind us. They're in front of us. We're still going down the road, the vision God has given us. We're not done yet. And it's going to take a lot of us throwing in to make it happen. And I'm telling you what, we're going to look back and we're going to say, wow. Wow. Look what God did. And a perfect example, our food pantry. And, and I understand a lot of us don't have a lot of, of resources. I get that. And I'm not telling you to give of something you don't have. If you don't have it, I'm not asking you to do that. What I am saying is give what God tells you to give. And you look, our food pantry, last time, we, we gave food to 18 families. 19 families. We raised money. We raised food items. And we were able to give food to 19 families. You look around, we're not a church of 700 people. There's churches in this valley that have 700 people that aren't doing stuff like that. That's right. But you look because God has given us a mission to help people, to serve, to be Jesus. Amen. And he provides. So when God tells us, we need to give willingly, not begrudgingly. You, you, you've heard of churches that are startup churches, their church plants, and um, the, the core leaders. Um, I'm reading this book, and, and actually it's the one we're doing in our uh, leadership development, is uh, Courageous Leadership by Bill Hybels. And when they planted their church, people were getting second mortgages on their houses for this church. 
But you go, why would they do that for a church? Because they saw the bigger picture. It's not about the church. It's about the mission that God has given that church. You see, it's not about sunrise. We're not trying to grow sunrise. We're trying to grow souls in the kingdom of Christ. Amen. And that's what we're doing. That's our mission. We're not trying to fill up these pews so we can say, wow, look at our big church. No, we're trying to fill these pews with people who need to be set free from Satan's hold. That's what it's about. And that's what we're doing. And let me tell you something. And I said, oh, I didn't get this in there. Huh. Um, you, you heard me say it. You can, and I think it was even last week. You can tell what somebody's first love is by looking at their bank account. Let that sink in a minute. You can tell what somebody's first love is by looking at their bank account. If you look at someone's bank account and all their money is being spent on debt, they love things. They love houses. They love cars. They love clothes. They love shoes. They love motorcycles, four-wheelers. If you look at somebody's bank account and it's all being spent on uh, food, I think that's an obvious one. If you look at someone's bank account and 20% of their income is going to the church or to help other people, guess what their first love is? Jesus. You can look at someone's bank account and tell who they love or what they love. And if you've never given till it hurts, if you've never given to the point where you don't know where it's coming from but God told you to do it, you don't know sacrificial giving. When I went through my divorce, I still tithed. And you can, and I can to this day write down everything. And it does not make sense how I was able to tithe. It absolutely does not make sense. The numbers do not add up. But I was able, I didn't have extra. I didn't have money to go do stuff, which was fine. But I was able to take care of me and my kids' needs and still tithe. Didn't miss a lick. And it hurt. Man, I tell you, sitting there writing that check that first time, I'm like, God, there's no way. He said, where's your trust? I said, okay, I'm going to do it. God's amazing. Amen. We, we look at ours math and we go two plus two is four. God looks at it and goes, two plus two equals a th cattle on a thousand hills. That's God's math. You see, in the Psalms, we're told that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He has resources that you and I don't have. And so you need to give willingly. And when we give willingly, all of us, amazing things are going to happen. And so this morning, I, I pray that God has touched you in an area that you've been holding back. You haven't been willing to give God everything in your life if you're a born-again believer. Because most of us, we all have that little area, don't we? If we're going to be real, maybe it's a lack of trust, a lack of faith. Maybe it's putting Jesus first in our lives. Maybe it's our finances. Whatever it is. I pray God spoke to you somewhere this morning. And... If you're not a born-again believer, you've never been saved, you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I want you to understand something today. Jesus Christ went to that old rugged cross. He died on that old rugged cross so you can be saved. So you can have an eternity in heaven. So you can be saved, forgiven of your sins. It's really as simple as ABCs. A, you admit you're a sinner, and all of us have sinned. B, you believe on Jesus Christ. You ask him to come into your heart to save you. And C, you choose to follow him. You stop following the world. You stop following your wants and desires, and you follow Jesus. You choose to follow him. Admit you're a sinner, believe on Jesus, and choose to follow him. And if you're a believer and you're not sold out this morning, Jesus isn't first in your life, today's the day. Today's the day to have revival in your heart, to come back. Come back to your first love and say, Jesus, 
I've held back. I haven't had a willing heart in some of these areas. It's time I let you have it all, Jesus. So if you have a need this morning, whatever it is, you need me to pray with you, grab me, we'll pray together, or you can pray by yourself here in a minute. But let's pray now. God in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we are just so humbled and grateful that you sent Jesus to die on that cross. Lord, I pray if there's any unbelievers among us that they'd be saved today. God, that you'd lead them to salvation. Father, I pray for the backslidden believers. They haven't had a willing heart in some of these areas. They're not sold out. God, I pray today that, Father, we would come back to our first love, Jesus. We'd have a willing heart. Father, you've been speaking to people this morning. I pray that whatever you've convicted them in, whatever you've been speaking to them, that, God, today they'd come back and make it right. For the lost, lead them to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So the altar's opened up here as soon as they get ready to start singing. So whatever your need is this morning, you can grab me, we can pray together, or you can pray by yourself.